Welcome to our next video lecture. We are still in unit one, the sensation and perception portion. Today we are focusing on module 1.6b, which is all about vision. So we're gonna start first with just the parts. We're gonna just look at the anatomy. What is each part of the eye? What does each of those parts do? So you can see here, um, light enters into the eye. So the first thing is this protective layer out here on the eye. This is like a protective thin layer called our cornea. And all that does is it helps to protect from like dirt and debris and stuff from getting into our eye. Um, for those of you that ever cut your cornea before, you know that it is extremely painful when you cut that cornea and allow um, any sort of air or any light or anything to get past that cornea. So it's really important to keep that protective layer um, nice and um, intact. So then light waves directly enter into the pupil. The pupil is that dark black dot that you have on your eye. And that pupil is controlled by that colored ring, which is actually a muscle. The colored ring or muscle is called the iris. And that iris um, constricts and dilates your pupils depending on the light in the room. So if it's dark, the pupils are gonna get larger and dilate. If it's bright, that pupil is gonna constrict and be smaller. So if you think about it like a, um, you know, like what, what it takes in is if, if the pupils are smaller, the image that it casts on the back of the eye is going to be smaller. If the pupils dilate and get larger, the image that it's going to cast is going to be much larger on the retina. So really depending on how big that opening is in the pupil will depend on how much area of the retina is going to be covered by um, each of those um, parts of the image. So once it goes, that light energy goes through the pupil, it hits the lens. And the lens is just like the lens of a camera where it bends and moves and it, it has the process of changing that shape and focusing that object in order to um, put it, that object onto the back of the eye or the retina. You can see here the object is on the back of the eye upside down, which is exactly what happens is that the objects get come into the eye. The light bends and moves it and casts that back on the back of the eye or the retina upside down, not very clear. So it's not until it gets to the brain that we're able to flip that image, fill in for those blanks and have um, vision or be able to see it. So that process of the lens bending and changing shape to focus the objects on the retina, that is, process is called accommodation. So I might write that down. So then what happens is we cast that image um, on the back of the eye known as the retina. There is one specific portion of the retina that you need to know, and that's called the fovea. This is the small, tiny area of the retina that's the focal point. It's the central focus area of the retina, and um, it allows us to have the most clear and fine details. Detailed vision happens in that fovea. So all along this retina and in the fovea are something called photoreceptors. And there's two types of photoreceptors. One are cones and one are rods. Um, let's go to this slide. So you see that we have got cones and rods on the eye. Um, cones allow us to see color and rods allow us to see black and white. So when we looked at this part of the eye, in the fovea, there is a concentration of cones, only cones. As you go on the outside of the retina, that's where you'll find the rods. So the fovea is just a cluster of cones, and outside of that are our rods. So if you think about it, when our pupil is dilated, it dilates when it's dark outside, okay? So when it's dark, our pupil gets larger. The image that is cast on our retina is larger. Hence why we need the rods that are on the outer skirts of the eye in order to interpret the black and white. In contrast to that, when it's light outside, our pupils get smaller and the image that it casts on our retina is much smaller. Well, it happens to be when it's light outside or bright outside is also when those pupils constrict. And so when it's light, when it's bright, we are more likely to be looking at things in color. And that's why we have that concentration of cones right in that fovea area, because the image that it takes in is uh, much smaller. So back to this sign. So 
what happens? We have the retina on the back of the eye, the entirety. We've got the focal point of that retina called the fovea. We also have this nice long, what's called an optic nerve. And you can see that back here, right here, this optic nerve, which takes um, information from the eye and takes it to the brain to be able to be processed. We also have right here, this little spot right here is called the blind spot. This is a part of the retina that contains no rods or cones. Um, for most of your life, your brain, well, for most of everything, your brain fills in for that tiny, tiny, tiny little spot that at all times we don't take any um, light energy in. However, we're going to do an activity in class where you're going to be able to see that blind spot that it does actually exist. It doesn't bother us day to day because our brain fills in for the spots that it's missing, um, but there is a way that we can see our blind spot. Okay, so those are the parts. So what we're looking at too is, okay, once that light energy gets to the back of the eye, gets to that retina, what happens to it? Well, first of all, that light starts and goes all the way into the third layer of that retina, back to those rods and cones. And those cones, like we said, are responsible for interpreting color, and the rods are responsible for interpreting black and white. So what they do is they do a process called transduction. Transduction is also called transformation. So where it transforms that light energy and turns it into a neural message, because our brain can't process light energy our brain can't do that. It can only process neural messages. So those rods and cones are responsible for that process of transduction where they transform or transduct light into a neural message that our brain can read. So once again, these photoreceptors, the rods and cones, transduct the message, turn it into something that our brain can process. So once it transducts, it goes to the bipolar cells, which it's kind of hard to see here. Oops. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but the cones each get their own singular bipolar cell, which is why we have such an ability to see finer detail. And um, there's a lot more clarity in the information that comes to our fovea because we have one singular bipolar cell per cone. So it's allowing us to see that detail much crisper um, when we're taking the information from the fovea. And then on the outside of that, um, any of the rods and cones on the outside of the fovea, those share bipolar cells. Okay, so once it goes to the bipolar cell, so it's been transducted into a neural message, travels to the bipolar cell, then it goes to the ganglion cells, which all come together to go down the optic nerve of um, the eye, which takes those neural messages to the brain where we process it. Um, as we know, once it goes down that optic nerve, it has to first go to the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus takes in all senses except for smell and sends them where they need to go. So that's exactly what happens is the thalamus takes that neural message that's been sent and it takes it to the occipital lobe where the occipital lobe can process that visual, that vision. It can interpret those neural messages and give us the ability to, to see. So what's happening with this light energy? And this is going to be a little bit of some physics for us. Um, but what happens is we have energy that kind of bombards our body all the time, right? We have different senses that can decode those different energies. Um, light energy is an example of part of the energy that comes into our body. So each sense is responsible for a different, you know, different part of the energy. Um, but energy is measured overall in wavelengths that each have peaks and valleys, highs and lows. And so the distance between peak to peak in a wave right here to here is known as a wavelength. And so we, um, our eyes kind of decode the shorter wavelengths and the longer wavelengths, those kind of minor variations in those wavelengths to allow us to interpret color. So if you see here, look at all of this energy we take in, all of these wavelengths, some really close together, some really far apart. But yet the only thing that's visible to us is this short little spectrum of colors and this short little area of wavelengths. And so we really, of all the energy that's around us in the world, we are only able to really process and interpret some of it. So what does that mean? It means that when we look at our wavelengths, the difference between how short 
or how long those wavelengths are. And again, the wavelength is the difference between here and here, right? Depending on whether it's short or long will depend on what color we're able to see. So if it's a short wavelength, meaning this is shorter than this, we're gonna see more bluish colors. And the closer we get to the longer wavelengths, the closer we get to longer, um, we get to more reddish colors. We also look at the amplitude, right? The amplitude is the up and down. If we have great amplitude, a lot of amplitude, the color is gonna be brighter. And if we have smaller amplitude, that color is gonna be much duller. So when we look at the energy, the light energy that our brain takes in, right? Or that our eyes take in, we have to keep in mind, what does the wavelengths tell us? What does the amplitude tell us? For the wavelengths, you can think about like the Smurfs as being blue and Smurfs are short. And you can think of the long wavelengths, you can think about it as like red, like Clifford. Clifford the dog is really long and big. So he would be the reddish colors. There are two different kind of theories of um, color vision and theories of how we take in, how the cones interpret color. So the first one is the trichromatic theory of color. And what this theory states is that each of our cones only represent one of three colors, those three primary colors, either blue cones, green cones, or red cones. And within those three different cones, it's a combination of those cones that make out color. And so that is one theory. And so the belief is, is that um, colorblindness, which really shouldn't be called colorblindness, it should really just be called color deficient. The belief is from this theory is that we are color deficient in one of the colors, right? So we might be deficient in reds. So we can see blues and greens, but we can't see hues of reds. Or maybe you have blue-green color blindness, or it's better to call it color deficiencies. So you can't make out the blue and green. Those cones don't work, but you do have your red ones. So it's not that somebody who's colorblind can't see any color. It's that they have deficiencies in certain colors that impact their ability to see. Most of the time it's one or two. Very rarely is somebody color deficient in all three of those primary colors. So really we should think about this as color deficiency, not necessarily color blindness. So this trichromatic theory, again, theory of color, is that each cone is a different color and it's a combination of those cones being activated that lead us to see a variety of colors that can be made with the combination of those three colors. So this might look familiar. When you go to the eye doctor, they ask you to tell what number is inside of that, that, that circle. And they have different combinations of these to see, do you have color deficiency in any of the red, the green, or the blue, which is gonna lead you to have a difficulty in identifying what number is in the center of that. The second theory is the opponent process theory. And the opponent process theory is a little bit different in that it believes that we have what's called opposing cones. So rather than having one cone that's red, one cone that's green, one cone that's blue, they believe that we have opposing cones. So one cone is for reds and greens, one cone is for yellows and blues, and one cone is for whites and blacks. And so the belief is, is that those cones will fire either red or green. The cone will either fire yellow or blue, and the cone will either fire white or black. But those cones aren't going to fire both of those colors at the same time. So we have multiple colors that are multiple combinations of those opposing colors. So I, should, I would probably write down what are those opposing colors, that there's a red-green opponent, a yellow-blue opponent, and a white-black opponent. And so that belief is, is that when that cone is firing red, it's not firing green at the same time, but rather like when we talk about neurons firing, having that refractory period, when it's done over firing red, it might flip and then fire green or so on and so forth. It might go back and forth. Uh, so this theory does a really nice job of um, helping us understand better what's called um, I'm drawing a blank to it. What's called the, why am I drawing a blank? Um, gosh darn it, it's this thing. Why we draw a blank between, um, oh my goodness, what is going on with me today? 
Give me a second. I am drawing a blank on this. Um, oh, it helps us understand the after image effect. I cannot believe that I was not able to remember that. Um, so the after image effect. So this theory does a good job of explaining that. So if you take a second right now, I'm going to have you just stare at the dot in the center. Stare at it, stare at it, stare at it. Stop. Don't look anywhere else. Just stare at the dot in the center. Keep on staring at it. Keep on staring at it. So did you see for a quick second the American flag, what it's supposed to look like? This theory, the opponent process theory, helps us understand this after image effect, how we can stare at this for so long. And then when we click to the next slide on that white screen, it's almost as if those opposing colors fired. So if we go back to here, we know red and green, right? So what was happening is I was forcing your green cones to fire, 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 fire. And then they needed that refractory period. And as soon as that white screen came, that refractory period came in and suddenly those red, those red neurons started firing, firing, firing. And so that's what allowed us to be able to experience that after image. So the trichromatic theory does, a, I think, a better job of explaining color deficiencies, but this um, opponent process theory does a much better job of explaining the opponent process theory. Our final piece is what happens in the brain. So we know that our brain is what interprets what we see, right? We see with our brain, we don't see with our eyes. So our eyes just merely take in that energy, take in um, that light energy and convert it to something that our brain can process. So it converts that energy, transducts that energy via the photoreceptors of the cones and rods into a neural message that can then be processed by our brain and our visual cortex, which happens to be in our occipital lobe. And so kind of two things are happening um, in the brain at this time. One of those is that we have what's called um, feature detectors. And the feature detectors are the little portions of our brain that are solely responsible um, for picking out edges, lines, angles. So there's specific, um, there's specific neurons in that occipital lobe that get that information from those ganglion cells in the retina, and they identify those individual features. So there's specific neurons in our brain just to help us see angles and lines and edges. Additionally, what's happening in the brain is something called parallel processing. And parallel processing is a visual process in our brain um, where our brain separately but simultaneously processes numerous things. It processes color. At the same time, it processes motion. At the same time, it processes depth, color, form. All of those things are processed at exactly the same time in different portions of our brain simultaneously. And those come together to give us a full image of a person who has color, who has motion, who has form, who has depth. Um, and so all of those things are processed in different areas simultaneously to give us the full picture of visual understanding. That is it for the parts and functions of the eye, how energy is taken into the eye, transducted by those photoreceptors, how it goes down to the optic nerve, to the thalamus, and then what happens when it gets to the portion of the brain. If you have any questions, please make sure you bring those up. Have a wonderful day.